first question for you is um, your album Scream is coming out soon. Can you tell me a little bit about the album? Yeah, um, the album Scream um, comes out at the end of this month. And uh, um, one of the things about this, most albums that I do, I usually do like 20 tracks, choose the best 13. And um, on this album, I did 23 tracks. And um, we couldn't really figure out which tracks we were going to cut, which ones we wanted to use. I mean, it got to be pretty ugly in the office. We were fighting about it. Um, so we decided, you know, with, with iTunes now and all the digital uh, you know, download portals, it's really not necessary to, uh, you know, you can deliver as many tracks as you want. So we decided to put out all 23 tracks. Um, and and it's, I think it's a perfect balance, the vocals and instrumentals. It's like half vocal, half instrumental. And um, one of the things about this album is uh, I really focused on, you know, big room themes, uh, both with the vocals and also with the, uh, with the melodies. Okay. Um, premiered at EDC New York was your track uh, Caught. Um, can you talk a little about that track? Yeah, Caught, video? Yeah, Caught was the first track uh, off the album with um, one of the artists that we signed to uh, our management group, uh, Adina Buttar. Um, she's an amazing uh, songwriter and, and a fantastic singer. I remember uh, she sent me a, a track that she had did um, and, and I, I fell in love with the vocal right away. It was like, wow. And um, one of the cool things about Adina as well is she's very uh, involved with the production as well. She has a great ear and, and uh, um, so she was also very helpful, uh, not just on, on, on Caught and another track that we, did, we did on the album Universe is Mine, but she was actually a, a good person to reference with uh, some of the other parts of the album. Uh, um, so yeah, that, that was a lot of fun, uh, you know, and, and I think the perfect track to kind of like uh, launch this new album. Um, at EDC Las Vegas, it was unfortunate that your set was cut short due to the storm. Uh, can yeah. you talk a little about the experience and have you been on a show before where for some any reason the show had to be cut short? Well, um, yeah, that was crazy. I mean, I remember when I got up on stage, I looked uh, around and I saw the trusses moving and I saw the, the giant LEDs behind me swaying back and forth and then seeing the speakers swaying. And I was just thinking to myself, wow, this is, uh, I've never seen this before. And I've done festivals, you know, for the last five, six years all over the world. So I, I've never seen anything like that. But um, went on and played and, and uh, you know, I think maybe an hour into my set, maybe less than that, they were like, listen, we got to get everybody out of here now. And, and, and I'm very, very, um, you know, of course, I was disappointed that it happened. But at the same time, I also agreed, you know, I was like, this safety first and I, I'm really proud of our scene um, because you know uh, everybody it's like everybody understood you know I'm, I'm proud of the organizers for putting the safety first and I'm proud of our scene for uh, you know understanding because uh, I said this in another interview if it, if it would have been happened at a, me a heavy metal concert or a hip-hop concert they probably would have ripped the stages down you know um, but it goes to show how much love and respect we have in our scene and uh, like I said I'm very proud um, yeah, it happened. I actually one other time a, a set got cut short. I remember I was playing in Amsterdam. I uh, know in Rotterdam. Um, I was actually playing with Armin van Buren, and a riot started. Uh, I guess Rotterdam and Amsterdam are notorious football uh, uh, rivals, and I think that was the week when Amsterdam was playing Rotterdam uh, in in a, in a match. So it was a lot of uh, tension, and they started rioting and. and uh, that was the only other time, but nothing like this where you saw giant LEDs and trusses swaying back and forth. It was really crazy. Okay, um, after you got off stage, you went back to the little studio. What was Let It Call, the Storm Shelter say? It was yeah. you, back-to-back -back Armin, back-to-back Johan Miller, yeah. w, w Cosmic Gate. Later on, you were then moved to what was called the Wide Awake Card in the middle of the grass. Can you talk a little about that experience? Well, you know, one of the things was they asked me if I would do it, and I was like, absolutely, you know, it, it sounds like fun. Um, and they told me it was the only stage that was open. It, will, it would be the only thing. So I right away I knew it wasn't just trans fans. It wasn't, uh, it was fans from all the different stages. Um, so I wanted to make sure and just my, you know, I, I put away all of my tracks, and I just like went back to being a DJ, where it was like, here's a mixture of people from that love different styles, and you know, I just I just played a set that I thought would like fit the whole vibe of the the moment, um, and it worked, turned out really really well. 
you know, the people were going, uh, were jumping and going crazy, and, and it, it just felt, I haven't had a feeling like that in a long time, because there was no lights, there was no production, it was me on this, like, I don't even know what it was, it was like a cart or trailer or something, the way, right? yeah, and, and it was wobbling back and forth whenever I was jumping up and down, but it was like, it was raw, you know, it was like, what our, what our scene started uh, as, you know, and it was very, 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 it was a lot of fun. So you even said you said uh, that, you, that you saved EDC for them. Well, you know, uh, I, I appreciate that, but uh, I, I think that the people that saved EDC were the fans uh, who were being who were respectful and, and understood that um, safety comes first. You know, because like, to be honest with you, if anything would have happened, um, you know what I mean? That that it would have been awful if anything happened. Um, you always do a. Uh, uh, Marcus Schultz versus Ferry Corsten. Can you talk a little about the instruments back to back? Well, Ferry and I started, um, you know, uh, I think last year uh, we, we were playing a lot of the same gigs together. We were traveling a lot together. And we've always been, you know, we've been friends for a long time. But, you know, we, we both kind of realized that, you know, we miss just the fun. Uh, you know, it, the scene can get really political. Right. And uh, we just got to a point where we were like so tired of all the politics and everything. And we were just like, Let's just have fun, you know. Let's do sets together, play back to back. Let's just have fun. Go in the studio. Let's make a track together, you know. Let no politics, no management. Let's just uh, they can figure it out afterwards. Let's just have fun, and and I think that's what um, you know. I think people are starting to feel um, in the sets when when Ferry and I are playing together. It's just like it, the two of us are just having a great time, you know, enjoying playing together, enjoying the crowd. Uh, enjoying the music and, and I think that's what can happen when um, you know politics and egos and everything gets put off to the side and you just enjoy the party and en enjoy uh, the music you guys said uh, at the Skype interview you guys did together uh, you were talking about doing a remix of uh, Speedy J pool oh yeah uh, yeah I'm really excited about talking about it is that still in the world yeah it's uh, you know we, we uh, he came over to my studio during winter music conference and we started messing with it a little bit but um, we ran out of, out of ideas you know we got the riff going and the riff sounds really crazy um, but I think that you know we still got to come up with some ideas for it and one of the things about um, you know there's some tracks that I've done uh, that have sat on the shelf for a year maybe longer before I got like, oh, I know what it needs, and then you go back to it. So it's on the shelf there. It's, uh, it's something that if one of us can come up with, a, with the second part to it, um, you know, it could be something that's very special. But uh, um, that being said, we, you know, I, we're going to get back together uh, and do some more stuff in the studio and, uh, um, you know, just um, have fun. Awesome. Um, other than Miami and Florida, is there anywhere in the U.S. you can see yourself Reciting, you know, I could live any. Well, no, I can't. I can't say that I could live anywhere. There's some places it's like I would never want to live here. But um, you know, like here, obviously here in LA, you know, LA is a uh, god. I mean, there's always something happening here in the city. I have so many friends here in the city. Um, I love New York City as well. New, there's nothing more amazing than New York City in the summertime. Uh, although in the winter time, it can be pretty brutal. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, I at San Francisco. I love San Francisco too. I think, I think San Francisco is one of the most European. Is the most European city in the United States. Um, so any of those cities. But you know, the nice thing about what I do is uh, I'm in different cities almost every night of the week. Um, so I'm able to uh, uh, experience different cultures, different cities, different people, and uh, I just feel very. You know, blessed that uh, I'm able to to do that. I'm, I'm one of the lucky ones who's able to travel the world. Cool. Um, you always talk about Club Space Miami as being a wonderful place. I visited myself. It is a beautiful club. Um, yeah. Is there other places in the world that you that you always look forward into playing? Well, yeah, for sure. Avalon is is one of them. Uh, government in Toronto is amazing. Um, you know, there's also Stereo in Montreal that I have a very special connection with. Um, you know, I like those clubs where, I, I guess it's where you can go in and people, you know, you're scheduled to play a two-hour set or a three-hour set, and it turns in, it can turn into a nine or ten-hour set. You know, those are the kind of places I love. The places where um, everything just feels like, hey, you know, whatever, wherever the party takes us, 
and the people are like open for it. You know, those are the kind of places that I love. And um, like, you know, Avalon here for sure is one of those places, you know. Um, when I, 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 I did the, my solo set, uh, we, just, we had no idea how it was going to go. And uh, we just kept going and going and going. And it was, you know, place, memories, uh, memories like that, you know, last forever, you know, because uh, you, you think about, you think back and you're like, yeah, you know, I, I was only supposed to play for three hours. I wound up playing for 12. <laughs> you know, it's like. Talking about your set times in, then we know you like to do extended sets, play as long as you can, but what is your ideal set time? Oh, it all depends. I mean, you know, the, the long sets are great because, you know, you when I make uh, the longer sets, it's almost like three DJs. You know, I'll play an opening set, a peak hour set, and then like an after hour set. Um, that's why I really love uh, playing those long sets like that. But uh, for me, and then when I do the uh, the shorter sets, it's more of a, a show. You know, my, my sets are crafted out to, uh, you know, a lot of my own tracks and, and there's, you know, the certain themes that, that I want to play. And, um, so, I, I don't know, it's tough to say. Uh, I, you know, I, I consider myself like a DJ, a real DJ who can adapt to any situation, you know, like the EDC situation or playing, uh, you know, a 10 hour set. Um, you know, I'm not one of those DJs who has a one hour set and I just travel the world playing that one hour set on every single stage. It's, you know, I'm able to adapt. Um, I saw the interview online that you posted on YouTube where the girl uh, asked you about Concrete Angel and a bunch of <laughs> festivals you didn't play at. Is, is there any other interview that you can recall that stuck to your mind for some specific reason? Uh, yeah, I remember one interview I did in uh, Scotland and one of the questions was they asked me who were the three most beautiful women in the world and I was so like, I was stuck and I mentioned this porn star that uh, uh, from, from like the, the 70s or 80s uh, and uh, that, that was kind of fun. Is there any track other than yours or anybody else's, uh, a trans track preferably, that you think was a true game changer to the scene over the years? Oh wow, there's so many. You know, I mean, you can look at the 1999 era, um, but I'm sure that the, this today's generation is sick and tired of hearing about how trance used to be in, in 1999. Um, but I think that, um, you know, like maybe something that's more current that, that, that changed the sound of trance. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think when Rank One and Cosmic Gate kind of changed their style to more like you know, like 132 beats per minute, more big bass lines. I think that was when everybody just kind of like said, hey, you know what, trance has changed. You know, but um, so I, I think those two, Rank One and Cosmic Gate, for me, um, kind of the way they reinvented themselves um, a couple of years ago, I think uh, that was probably one of the more um, groundbreaking things for today's scene. Okay. Um your nickname is the Unicorn Slayer. Um, if you can put a number on it, how many unicorns do you think you've slain over the years? Oh gosh, yeah, I, I can't even. I don't keep track anymore. You know, um, <laughs> I don't, I'll put it at uh, at least. Let's see, 175 gigs a year. Let's say the last uh, two years. So I'd say maybe uh, yeah, 350. Can't believe I, I've slain at least 350 unicorns. Can't tell me how the the nickname started. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. The nickname actually started. Somebody uh, tweeted um, uh, something about uh, yeah, Marcus is the unicorn slayer of trance. Um, you know, and, and it was kind of like cool. So I retweeted it, and from that retweet, it just caught fire. You know, every it just kind of stuck. It was, I think that was that's the cool thing about. Um, you know, some of these uh, uh, like trends, they just kind of catch on their own. You don't have to do anything. It just catches fire all by itself. And that's what happened with that. It was just a retweeting somebody's tweet, and next thing you know, it's, you know, trending, right? Hi, I'm Marcus Schultz. Thank you for tuning in to Raw Beats.